Welcome to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Video History Project. Today we're very fortunate to have with us Dr. William Hoskins, an OBGYN, but more importantly, a gynecologic oncologist. He has agreed to just sit with us today and discuss some of his history as well as the history of our specialty. Bill, thank you very much for You're coming. Welcome. Appreciate it. Let's get a little of your background first. Where were you born? I was born in a little mountain village not, not far from here in, in, in eastern Tennessee and uh, went to the University of Tennessee for college and the University of Tennessee Memphis for medical school. And uh, then after that I went into the Navy and I uh, spent 20 years in the Navy. I did, I, did, um, <clears throat> I did my training in the Navy, my residency, my internship, my residency, and then the Navy sent me to the University of Miami for uh, my own G1 Oncology Fellowship. And then after that, uh, I went to the National Naval Medical Center and I stayed for the rest of my career. And then uh, I retired uh, from the Navy and uh, took a job at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center where I started out as associate chief and then became chief of the gynecology service at Sloan Kettering. And I stayed there another 20 years. Well, you have a long history of being involved with the college in our oncology area. But at the time when you first came in, there was no such thing as a subspecialty. How did the subspecialty start? What was the background? Well, actually, you know, before my year, my year group was the first board approved fellowship group. Uh, before that, uh, people did train, but they trained in ad hoc programs and they were much like an apprenticeship uh, and they had no set length or criteria or anything. So in other words, some people would train for one year, some people would train for two years, some people would just apprentice to a G1 oncologist and may, they might do that for several years before they went out totally on their own. So it was very informal and uh, in my year group, the board had established for the first time a, a formal fellowship that was two years in length uh, for somebody who had finished OBGYN training and wanted to become a G1 oncologist. Uh, there were relatively few uh, programs initially. Uh, I was, you know, fortunate to get into one of the f approved programs at the University of Miami. And then after I finished my fellowship <coughs> and I went to the National Naval Medical Center, uh, Bob Park was at Walter Reed and he had gotten an approved fellowship for the Army. And we combined the Army-Navy programs, what later became the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. That was our uh, official program in Juwan Oncology, and it, we we rotated. We we would uh, our fellows would spend a year in the Navy, a year at the Navy Hospital, and a year at Walter Reed. It was a two-year program, and uh, that program con con continues until today. Let me take you back to that early days. Why do you think there was a need for board certification? Well, you know, before that, it was pretty much uh, apprenticeship. In other words, uh, there were not a huge number of G1 oncologists, but there were some. Uh, I don't know that. I don't know that there there was any, any title called G1 oncologist. It was primarily uh, gynecologists who specialized in in oncology, and. Uh, when the board uh, established uh, a formal program of gynecologic oncology, then they specified, you know, the, the amount of surgical training you had to have, uh, 
G1 Oncology was very different in that um, it was one of the few surgical specialties that required uh, rotations in and learning to do chemotherapy. So basically as fellows we had to learn you know how to do chemotherapy as well as to doing uh, radical surgery. Um, you know, before that, most of the radical surgery had been done by a few gynecologists and a lot of general surgeons. So we basically moved into an area uh, that was sort of a mixture of general surgery and uh, some G uh, GYN, you know, f informally trained GYN oncologists. And that became a formal training program with specified training in, you know, radical surgery uh, gastrointestinal and GU surgery, as well as chemotherapy. There was a lot of concern among gynecologists as the board made that approval, as you recall. Yeah. What do you think was a reason for that? Do you think it was truly financial, or do you think it was? Well, you know, <clears throat> up until then, uh, you know, there, there was no subspecialty training in, in G1 oncology. I mean, in G1 oncology, it was just gynecologists who uh, had a special interest and in, uh, either apprenticed or gradually moved into that. Uh, so, in a way, we we did uh, by establishing a formal subspecialty uh, with formal training. Uh, I guess we were were a threat to people who. Uh, sort of trained in a haphazard way, but may have had good training, just wasn't well organized. Uh, the board set out to set up a formal fellowship with, you know, a, a required amount of radical surgery of different types, uh, required that we learn chemotherapy. Uh, we had to learn, we all had to do ICU rotations and things. So it was, a, it was just a more formal uh, curriculum, uh, and I think because of that, uh, our training was pretty uniform. No matter whether you trained at, like I did at the University of Miami, or whether you trained uh, at another early program at Memorial Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson. Now that that has been established and we now all expect uh, cancer to be handled by a gynecologic oncologist, what do you see the future is? Well, I think that uh, I think the future is 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 strong uh, for G1 oncology simply because as we've as we've evolved, as OBGYN has evolved. Uh, as the other surgical subspecialties evolved, it's become a pretty organized system in that uh, G1 oncologists uh, are trained to do radical surgery and there's no longer that competition between general surgeons and urologists that there was. Initially, I think everybody sort of accepts that G1 oncologists are gonna do certain urologic and general surgery procedures, uh, it's certainly been well accepted in the field of OBGYN because uh, G1 oncologists now are a, a, a vital part of any residency program to teach residents. So I think it's evolved into uh, a mature subspecialty uh, which has a good place in the OBGYN community. Uh, and I think the relationships with, uh, with uh, OBGYN, uh, like the other subspecialties, is very good, very strong. Do you think that taking oncology out of the surgical rotation in a regular residency program has changed the perspective of students that want to do surgery going into OB? Well, you know, one of the one of the problems that we have in OBGYN is that uh, 
you know, there's an awful lot to learn. If you have, if you, if you have a, you, you know, you basically got a three-year, three-year residency following internship, and during that period of time, you have to learn obstetrics and and gynecology. Uh, both of those are pretty demanding specialties, and to try to combine the two together in in a, in a three-year period is is very difficult. Uh, Therefore, to get around that, I think the field of OBGYN has uh, evolved to the point that we now have maternal fetal medicine uh, people who are subspecialized in obstetrics, obstetrical care, uh, and we have G1 oncologists who are in cancer care, and, and of course now even more so we have people who are Specialized, subspecialized in advanced GYN surgery that's not oncologic surgery. Uh, you know, it's a matter of uh, evolution simply because you can't learn everything in OBGYN in three years and be a master of all of these intricate areas. A young OBGYN today that's interested in surgery. Do you think that they should direct themselves toward oncology? Well, I think there's, you know, for the for the young OBGYN uh, person who wants to go into a surgical subspecialty, they really have a lot of choice now because, uh, yes, if you want to do big cancer surgery, G1 oncology is the way to go. Uh, on the other hand, you've got uh, pelvic surgeons who are uh, the pelvic surgery fellowships, which uh, take, teach some very complicated pelvic surgery things that are not necessarily cancer related. Uh, so I think the specialty is, has recognized that uh, juvenile oncologists are really not good people to do all kinds of advanced gynecologic surgery. You need to have people who are trained in advanced benign surgery. Uh, so I think it I think it actually works out fairly well. The G1 oncologist uh, uh, manages GYN cancer. In, in most places, they do manage the chemotherapy as well as the surgery. Uh, some places, like where I, where I practiced at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, we were, you know, obviously a very huge program, and we had our own medical oncologist that did chemotherapy. So all we did at Memorial Sloan Kettering was the surgical side. Uh, but in most of the community, uh, G1 oncologists do both. Uh, I think the, the development of the specialty of pelvic surgery uh, for benign surgery has been a very good thing. And uh, I think that they've added a broader spectrum. Because, you know, to be very honest with you, G1 oncologists may know how to do a lot of big operations, but they're not really as good at complicated GYN benign surgery as these people are. You know, I think, I think that our specialty, I mean, our, the, the general specialty of OBGYN has evolved in a very good way in that now we have G1 oncologists, we have pelvic surgeons, we have people who specialize in high-risk obstetrics, and then we have a large cadre of general OBGYN people who can do the day-to-day -day stuff under the supervision of these people. Do you think that in a standard residency training program of three to four years, that it's necessary for a resident to do oncology and do oncologic surgery, or do you think it takes it away from the others? No, I think that, uh, I, I think that a G1 oncology rotation uh, for the general OBGYN person is, is very important. Uh, just like, you know, I, I think the high-risk obstetrics rotation is very important for the general OBGYN. Now they not, no one expects them to come out of a residency and do complicated gynecologic oncology surgery or to do very complicated obstetrical procedures. Uh, but I do think they need to be exposed to it during their residency. Uh, 
So that for two reasons. One, so they'll know better how to refer patients that are who need referral. And two, that's the, that's the place we get the subspecialists. They come out of OBGYN training and they decide which of those areas they want to subspecialize in. Now, the SGO, the Society for Gynecological mm -hmm. Oncologists, has moved off almost in to become a separate organization. Yes. Primarily because of what they do. You've been involved in the development of that organization from its very beginning. Yes. Why do you think it has become such a, a strong organization? Well, <clears throat> I think it has become a strong organization uh, in part because it's separate, it separated itself from OBGYN, uh, the, the mainstream organization, uh, but also equally because they stay involved in the mainstream OBGYN. So even though G1 Oncology has evolved into pretty much of a separate uh, society and organization, uh, all of the people in that society are basically OBGYN doctors who have a dual membership in, in OBGYN as well as in G1 Oncology. And I think the I think the relationship is, is, is good uh, between uh, the fields. Uh, we, you know, the, the Society of G1 Oncologists has a general gynecologist who sit on our, on our boards, and just like uh, G1 Oncologists sit on the OBGYN board, I mean, you know, sit on the organizational structures. So I think it's good. Interestingly, uh, the college and you were the director of college, He's had a rather strong oncology project for many years. Yes. Do you think that's something that ACOG should do? Or should it be limited just to SGO? No, I think, I think, uh, I don't think there's any reason to limit it to just the SGO. I think you have to, to, model it differently because, you know, if you're developing a GYN oncology program as part of the American College of OBGYN program, uh, you want to appeal to the general gynecologist who uh, doesn't practice only GYN oncology. Uh, so, so I think there's, there's room for uh, certainly having GYN oncology courses and things like that in the general OBGYN community. It's just that you have to realize that uh, uh, many of the gynecologists who may take those courses are not, not necessarily going to be G or GYN oncologists. Well, diagnosis sometimes becomes more important than therapy. It does. In terms of it. If you had a young OBGYN come to you today, and say, I've been thinking about going into uh, GYN oncology and getting a fellowship. Tell me, what, uh, what should I expect and why should I do that? Well, you know, I think that, uh, you know, basically people who finish OBGYN residency today have one of two courses of action to take. They can either uh, stay in general OBGYN, in which case they would consult with oncologists and maternal fetal and et cetera, or they can go into one of the subspecialties. And, uh, and uh, I, would, I would encourage the, the fellow that if they have a particular interest in one of the subspecialties, whether it be maternal fetal medicine or gynecologic oncology, to certainly pursue it, uh, realizing that you know, it's, it's, it's time-wise expensive because that means that after a full residency, it's, they're going to have to spend another three or four years training in a subspecialty because of many, most of, this, of the G1 Oncology Fellowships today are four years long, uh, including, you know, they include a full year of research. So, uh, you know, if they've got the commitment to do that, uh, I think it's, it's good, and I certainly am pleased that uh, enough people have that commitment each year to fill up our fellowship programs. Notice then, 
one of the things that's happening in our specialty is that the men tend to go into oncology while the women tend to go into others. Do you think well, that that's a reality or is that no, just a that's, perception? That's changing because uh, uh, I understand what you're saying, but the reason that that's changing is that uh, uh, more and more OBGYN is a field dominated by women. And so therefore, uh, eventually, all of the specialists will be dominated by women too, and simply because of the numbers. Uh, I don't think that, uh, and I don't think, I mean, in, in at, the, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, you know, our fellowship program, uh, when I first got to Memorial Sloan Kettering, we had the occasional woman uh, by the time I finished at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we had the occasional man because most of them were women. Well, thank you very much for coming and sharing with us here today. Your insight and the ability that you had to be a leader in the field of GYN oncology has certainly been appreciated. Well, thank and you. the work you've done for the college in that regard has been very, very appreciated because you have been certainly one of the leaders that the college has relied upon extensively in this area. Thank so you. Thank you.